as I told you, it was one of the most interesting interviews I've ever had because we talk a lot for a lot of for a lot more things than just music, and I really appreciate that. That makes things interesting. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new episode of Iblis Manifestations podcast. I'm honored to be joined on today's episode by someone who I would consider is a very important figure within the underground extreme music scene and uh, has had a very strong influence uh, from the early days until now. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than the Magus from the Greek black metal band Necromantia. Necromantia are, of course, a uh, I, I would consider an absolutely legendary band amongst the pillars of the original Hellenic black metal scene, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. And, of course, uh, Magus and I talked about um, a lot of his history with Necromantia, and of course his uh, relationship with Baron Blood, who uh, unfortunately passed away back in 2019, and uh, and just the general sound and the artistic approach that they had with this uh, fascinating entity of uh, Necromantia is truly a, a classic in the uh, in the history of the underground scene. And it's important to mention that the Magus uh, has also been uh, working with uh, several other projects uh, such as uh, Eutheria, Thou Art Lord and uh, and of course his own band The Magus uh, which we've not heard much from yet but soon we will be. So we got to talk about that and uh, we got to talk a little bit about uh, his interests in the occult and how much that shapes their approach when it comes to writing and creating music and how much this has been applicable throughout the years. And we even got on to some discussions of the current times and the state of humanity as a whole and where uh, mankind is headed in general. And uh, his views were not so optimistic of the future of humanity, but uh, it was a very interesting and rewarding conversation nonetheless. And I'm sure that you guys will enjoy it. So, Coming up shortly will be my conversation with the Magus, uh, but before we go into that, if you are of course new to the Iblis Manifestations podcast, then please feel free to go and check out some of our uh, older back catalog uh, with various other uh, musicians, artists, uh, and legends. And uh, and yeah, feel free to subscribe, and if you do enjoy this content, please share it around, uh, it is very much appreciated. And uh, and with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to cut straight to the chase. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome the Magus to Iblis Manifestations. <laughs> Okay, hello sir, good evening, and welcome to Iblis Manifestations. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on this podcast. How are you doing this evening? Uh, the thing here is that in Greece it has started getting pretty fucking hot. So it's already sure. 31 degrees, uh, so I'm not well. <laughs> but uh, it's it's really great that... You invited me and uh, being here to talk with you. And uh, uh, it's uh, also for me uh, an honor to be in your show. 
honestly, man, the honor is absolutely mine. It's not every day that you get to speak to one of the, uh, I would say, one of the legends and most important figures within particularly the the sort of the creation movement of extreme metal as a whole. Mm. Uh, obviously, um, I think that, uh, you know, what you guys did with Necromantia, uh, and, and you obviously already alluded to this in, in the book anyway, but um, that was a very unique mm. uh, entity of music that you guys, uh, that, that, that yourself and Baron Blood created. So, uh, of course, you had Rotting Christ and Varathron, which were the legendary bands, you know, very, very important at that time. But with Necromantia, I feel like what you did was just so different uh, to not just them, but to pretty much every other band within the extreme metal scene. That There was nothing formulated about what you guys did. And um, I think the authenticity of it, uh, well, 30-odd years later still very much uh, speaks for itself, I think. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued and, and interested to try and dig a little bit further into the, uh, the background of what basically made this entity what it was. Um, legends. This is a very heavy word. For me, legends are uh, Celtic Frost, Venom, Meshful Fate and uh, Bathory. <laughs> Sure. Uh, but I can accept the, the creator, pioneer, something like that. Yes. Uh, what we did with Necromantia is that um, we, when we really want to... You know, back in the days, each band was trying to find its own way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not... Um, we didn't try to copy the successful ones because, in a sense, there were not many successful band, bands at that time. I mean, in commercially wise, uh, black metal was small, okay, underground. Black metal became more above ground after the incidents in Norway, actually. Of course. Uh, so it, it, the, the bands were kind of few compared to now. Uh, and each one of us was trying to figure its own style uh, and not uh, copy and copy and copy and copy. Uh, and that, uh, that, that was good. There are times that when you, when you try to create something unique, it's not always um, successful in a way. Okay, it's like um, cooking uh, a meal or something. You put a lot of ingredients inside. You want to make it different. You want to make it give a flavor to it. In our case, the flavor was we really want to create something that was really intense, intense in, at, uh, in an atmospheric way, really intense in a dark way, um, like, um, like something subterranean. Sure. Uh, yeah. We wanted our, our, our um, basic. Our basic aim was to create, when you listen to the music, it was when you listen to the music to create images in your mind, to create pictures in your mind. That was always our main goal. Uh, we want our music to be able to transmit the lyrics to your uh, soul, to your brain, and create, generate images. Uh, that is why we used unconventional a conventionally metal, a conventional for metal uh, ways and uh, instruments also. Uh, so our main thing is was were not to be a black metal band. Our main cause was to be a dark black band, if you know what I mean. The, the blackness and the darkness was the main ingredients. Were the main ingredients in Necromantia, in a sense. But when you listen to it in a dark space, in your own room, in, with your headphones or anything like that, to feel the darkness of the lyrics. That's what we wanted to do. And I think that you absolutely achieved that, particularly... Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've always been very good at uh, creating interludes in songs especially. Mm -hmm. And if you look at mm -hmm. uh, some songs like uh, The Warlock, 
for example. That, I can only imagine how terrifying it must have been uh, being someone listening to something like that in 1993. With, with songs? With songs? Uh, the Warlock. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. 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 I, I can only imagine what that must have felt like, you know, because again, this is for everyone listening. This is at an era where there is no internet, where there is a lot of things left to the imagination, you know, and it's in the same kind of era where uh, where people used to send uh, dead birds to Quarthen from Bathory. Or, for example, uh, people used to have rumors that King Diamond used to sleep in a coffin. So... When you kind of take that into consideration, I think that uh, you you were definitely successful in creating that um, that sort of imagination to the mind, you know, uh, even exactly. with perhaps some of the limited productions at the time. I think that you conveyed that very successfully. Um, the warlock, actually, the ritual part of the warlock um, was recorded as we say, on the go. There was a plan in our minds of what, how we will progress, but everything was done spontaneously in the studio during the recording. We have, we have the lyrics, which are actually invocations. Uh, we knew that this, this would be the basic, um, how can I say, the basic sound rag for everything, and that how, how it will um, develop until the climax of the ritual, but everything else was done there. Um, and that's what made it really interesting. Also, our promo 1990 was recorded in one night, all the way. We started around 6, 7 in the afternoon and we finished the next morning. There was, especially in the track, the, the Magia Veterum, the Utter Darkness, there was a lot of improvisation. We followed some, um, uh, some basic stuff and then we improvised up above it. That's what we did with most of our non-metal, let's say, parts. And uh, the thing is that it may be spontaneously made and made on the go, but the whole uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, the whole feeling that should be transmitted through this was in our minds already. It's the way I do my new band now, the Magus. Everything is here before it goes out there. Uh, so yes, we didn't plan exactly what it will be done, but the basic idea, the basic concept, which is the most important thing because you wanna be able I want to be able myself to feel of the same that the listener would feel. If I didn't feel it, then for me it would shit. Uh, so if I feel it, if we felt it, then it was successful for us at least. I understand. I guess that's the that sh sort of should be the main purpose of art anyway, is simply that you're channeling the, the energies and the emotions uh, which, uh, which are already surrounding you, but then I guess is finding tools within music to express that. And one thing, I sort of touched upon this uh, just earlier, but with Necromantia, one thing that was always so fascinating by it, uh, and this is not just album to album but this can be the case from one song to another song and it's that your work was never formulated and what do i mean by formulated is like especially when you listen to a lot of newer metal um it's uh, it's always trying to copy a formula oh this sound works so let's just stick to this and uh, and do the same thing because we know that it works rather than trying to take risks rather than trying mm -hmm. to explore mm -hmm. new new areas that perhaps um, aid in that tool of expression, um, uh, as we would call it. And I think that uh, that's particularly one of the things that makes it fascinating. But also, on one hand, where that becomes rewarding as well is that 
it leaves more room to the imagination. You know, you are not just listening to riffs. Uh, yes, you've got some, obviously, the double bass parts pretty much all the way through uh, most of the songs, but then you have to think, you know, and then you have to live through the lyrics. And there's this um, very interesting feeling. I mean, you mentioned as well, the um, you mentioned about the 1990 promo. I think that's already uh, i mean that's that's very creepy even if you want to listen to it uh, nowadays there's a very creepy sound like 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 you were saying that you were just performing what you were feeling like to me it's fascinating mm-hmm. because what are you feeling that that's what you come up with you know <laughs> it's a it's a very interesting dynamic there um that that's the direction that that you would want to go to naturally You see, first of all, very rarely we use the the formula reef, chorus, another reef, chorus. We we rarely use that. Um, Because when we uh, have a song, when we write a song, we tell a story. And the story is not actually that much repeating itself. It goes on and on and on and on and on until the end. that's why the structure of our song is not this typical structure. Even our metal songs are not that typical structure. And um, also, the lyrics are, for me, are the most important part of the music. Why do I say that? Because they determine how the song will sound, what atmosphere, what feeling, what emotion will be transmitted to the listener. They are the, the deciding factor of how the song will sound concerning atmospheres and emotions. And uh, you have, to, uh, most of the times, you have to read the lyrics when you listen to our music. People tend, tend, these days do not do it. Maybe in the early days we did it a little bit more. Uh, um, but uh, that's for me what makes black metal special in general. It's the lyrics. Mm-hmm. It's 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 uh, the atmosphere that transmitted and made the, make the lyrics turn the lyrics into music. That is what black metal is for. So if you don't have the lyrics, if you don't read the lyrics, then you miss half of the song. You just listen. Ah, okay, that's a cool. Um, that's a cool uh, part of the song. Oh, that's nice. That's impressive. But yeah, but what? Why it does it sound like mm-hmm. that? Read yeah. the lyrics, uh, and this this is how how we always did in Necromantia, and maybe also in the other bands that I participated uh, with. Other bands were kind of different, but in Necromantia it was the it was the the alpha, the A of the music. We started with the lyrics. So these are the lyrics. We're saying these are the lyrics. Okay, mm, what do we get from that? This. Okay, how do we make this into music? How do we get this this uh, morbid feeling, this awful feeling, this depressive feeling, this this scary feeling? How can we put notes to it? That's how I, we work. That's how I still work. Mm, what I do. I can very much appreciate that, uh, and and I I agree. I think that's actually. Um, in black metal, particularly, it's extremely and, and that, important. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. And that is why I think lyric videos are very important. Hmm. Because you can read the lyrics and listen to the music. Not just see, because not all the people, not all the bands have a huge budget to make a grand video. So sometimes a lyric video can be more effective than an average video, if you know what I mean. I do, because, like you said, it's saying the story of each particular part. I mean, I think, uh, you know, not every band is capable of pulling this off, because the reality is not every band actually has something to say. They just want to create music for the sake of it. But when you do have a story to tell, when you do have something to say about it, and each part of the song is uh, 
you know, there's a meaning, there's a reason behind every riff, as you put it. I think that's when it becomes a magical thing and, and it becomes interesting. But just onto the topic of lyrics as well, um, I do have to ask you, uh, I mean, this is perhaps this is kind of an obvious uh, thing, but how important would you say was the occult aspect when it came to the the themes of your music and how important was that to yourself personally highly important from the beginning from the moment we started necromantia when we decided with the Brown to form a band going this way we both had already a deep interest in the occult and the darker side of things Baron Blanc was more on the research level. I was more in the practical level. Uh, but we tend to, to walk the same path. I mean, my, uh, my dealing with the occult and the uh, dark side in general has defined my life, not my, just my music. Okay. Uh, and I don't say this just to be true. Okay. <laughs> There are great bands that, for example, Venom was such a great band, such an inspirational band, and they were never that much serious into what they were uh, singing in a practical level. They That's may true. be in the philosophical, they may be like, a, like a, a writer who writes a horror movie, okay, like a writer who writes a horror movie with, satanic, with a satanic cult or something like that. But still, it doesn't make, for, make them for me less black metal. Because the, the object they were dealing with, they dealt it with a decency and really good. Um, so I'm not, in the, I'm not the guy that says, if you're not uh, into the occult for real, you're not black metal. No. If your music and your art is made with honesty and decency and... Um, uh, if your research also is good, because let's remember that Venom gave us At War With Satan, which is a 20-minute epic song with That's epic cool. lyrics also. Uh, you're still on the right track. Some of us, some of the people who are into black metal, some musicians, tend to go for their own personal reasons more into the practical, let's say, beyond the philosophical, the more practical level of occultism. And um, I don't uh, talk about details that much in my interviews and in my presentations because I'm not a preacher of anything, in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm not a messiah, okay? When I was uh, younger and uh, Negromania was in the very early stage, there were people coming to me, come teach us this um, uh, mystic ritual or this kind of thing. Guys, no. You find your own way. I do what I do, I do it for me. What you want to do, it's up to you. So, yes, occultism has defined, uh, uh, and Satanism, uh, the way I see Satanism, uh, has defined my life, uh, not just my music. In what way would you say it's defined it? So, in a, if, if you were to put it into the perspective of... Um, is this helpful? Is this a pessimistic view? Or is this an empowering thing? Because I do... But, uh, recall... It's all of this. All sure. of this. In a way, sure. all of this. Sometimes it's pessimistic. Now, in the new project uh, that is coming out in October, the, the Magus album, it's full of rage. Why? It's rage. It's, it's, a, it's the rage of Lucifer against humanity. Because mm -hmm. I see Lucifer as an entity like Prometheus in the Greek mythology. We gave the light, we gave the fire to the people, we gave the apple uh, of knowledge to the people. And uh, people uh, fucked it up. Humanity completely fucked it up. So Lucifer is getting her, his revenge now. That's why the main concept of the album is about. So yes, sometimes pessimistic, but not depressive. Pessimistic the way the words, the things are but not depressive, sometimes, a lot of times empowering. I'm a wonder of the occult around 30 years now. So when you conclude, I'm always 
I'm always searching, okay, still. But when you conclude in some basic stuff in the metaphysical level of how things work, um, your perception of uh, life changes. Hmm. And it affects the way you do it, the way you live your life. Uh, so, yes. Uh, that's what I said it defined me. It changed my perception of things. I know that you uh, mentioned uh, in the book that when you were, uh, I think you were reading a book by Graham uh, Masterton, I believe. And uh, yeah, yeah, when I was 12, 12, 13, something like that. Sure. And I believe you mentioned that around the time you were 16, 17 years old, uh, you referred to it just as you said now, a metaphysical experience, uh, which uh, I don't yeah, expect you to intense. get into. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it, was, it was pretty intense. Of course, it scared the shit out of me. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, I, I remember I get out on the balcony and I saw a friend from passing from me and I said, man, come up, come up, come up, please come up. I, because I was, I was, I was scared. Okay. Uh, but this also proved some things to me to dig further, to go further, to look further. So yes, it, that was, that was a life changing experience for me. I mean, if it's any, uh, obviously, I don't expect you to go into details there, but if it's any consolation, I'm I'm on the same page with you in there in the sense that I personally always had suspicions and, uh, you know, uh, and I, know, I get that, you know, like a lot of times people don't talk about these things very openly. But for me, I think it's very important in our understanding of life and universe in general to actually discuss these mm -hmm. things or at the very least consider them because like you said it can be life-changing i mean for me i um like i said always had an open mind and a suspicion but never quite realized how literal some like you said metaphysical experiences could be until i would say maybe around the time i was 21 I think 21, mm -hmm. 22 years old. Yeah, my uh, myself and my girlfriend at the time uh, moved into a flat in Birmingham, and uh, after one week, we had to escape from there in the middle of the night because of the things that we saw. That until that point, I never thought was even possible. But then, after yeah, that, you, you think that sometimes you see them in the movies. Yeah, and when it yeah. happens to you, it's like fuck. Okay. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, but like you said, when you realize the depth of which uh, these things can go, um, uh, whether you want to call it paranormal, whether you want to call it, you know, because to me, what's frustrating is that there always seems to be a battle of your either scientific or your spiritual. There seems to be no merging of the two whereas in my world they are they're the same thing because at the end of it the day that's just something to aid in our understanding of the world which we have very little understanding of and uh, it would be foolish yes, for us true. to think otherwise true and uh, i think those things but those things for me also go together i'm really um I'm pro, a really pro-science guy, uh, but I always keep um, a spiritual and uh, metaphysical, um, how can I say it, um, ethics code when I check science, in a way. Uh, meaning that, of course, uh, what is proven by science is proven by science, but the spiritual and the metaphysical level is something sometimes even beyond science. The, 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 the physics rules, it's okay. It's just the physics, the, the rules of physics. Uh, gravity is gravity. It's nothing uh, weird for the metaphysical, if you know what I mean. It's an accepted reality. 
one accepted reality. Absolutely. And you got to think that a lot of the ways in which we look and observe science is mostly just third dimensional. But then there are many more layers to our reality and our uh, existence uh, as we know it. And it's not all just the physical realm, you know, and you can talk about, for example, uh, people's experiences on something like psychedelics or uh, mm-hmm. or DMT perhaps or you can just talk about uh, the other things like per- perhaps astral projection and uh, and these kind of things uh, which sometimes not always they do manifest in the physical reality and uh, yes. it seems to me that rather than observe and study these things we live in these camps of ignorance where their meaning is only defined by whether we believe in them or not, which I think is very limiting, don't you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, all the hells and paradises of the world, of all religions, are, um, are like skeptomorphs of the people who believe in them. That's mm. how I see them. Uh, things, uh, for me, are different. Uh, it's above that, above above heaven and hell in any kind of religion uh, m- m- it's more neutral in a way things sure. would, doesn't work that human oriented people tend to think that everything is around them no yes yes this is absolutely true and i think this is where a lot of people fall out of line with uh, with a lot of uh, religions in particular because mm-hmm. they say mm-hmm. and i don't claim to be i certainly uh, i'm not a follower of organized religion especially being someone who grew up in the islamic republic of iran if anything i'm more far more entitled to have nothing but content against it however mm. I, th- I i also am critical of people when they think that Oh, if there was a God, would there be so much suffering in the world? And I think, what makes you so fucking entitled that you even think that uh, you deserve that? You know, and uh, that's always something that, and I might, I used to think that way before when I was younger. But to me, like you said, we think that the world revolves around us somehow. And that's kind of yeah. missing the point, which is, I guess, you know, the religions of the, of the past, and I mean, before the monotheistic, Okay, spread yeah. all around the globe. We're more true, more naive, but more true in a in a sense that the God, the the the, the entities they call gods or demons or anything, was something that was out of them. I mean, extraterrestrial, if you know what I mean, alien to them. It's not mm-hmm. that uh, something different from them a bit more powerful, uh, but not something that totally gave a damn about their everyday life. Okay, they were, uh, as I say, in most, a lot of the religions, it was kind of a naive approach, but it was closer to the truth in a way. Mm. To the truth I, that I think that I have somehow put in a perspective. Um, for example, when I, when I was in Egypt and I saw some things there in the pyramids and all that stuff, uh, and they have, okay, this is the corridor that only the gods walk. Okay, maybe that's how it's connected to a lot of this, um, what we call today, in a sense, that's my opinion, extraterrestrials may be the gods of the past. Some different beings, not all powerful, like omnipotent, omni something, like monotheistic religions claim, beings of higher intelligence, entities of higher intelligence, but still, still another species, if you know what I mean. Not an well, omnipowerful god. 
there's a lot of different theories about this, as well as also uh, certain anecdotal evidence of... Uh, and since you are Iranian, there's a lot of knowledge there. Yes. In Iran. A lot. Because between Tigris and Ekfratis, the rivers, I think it was the cradle of civilization. Of the human civilization. This is correct. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we can talk about um, the possibility of how there were other civilizations on this earth that were more advanced than we are today, but perhaps in a different direction where their technology will have been more advanced uh, within the metaphysical realm so that these aliens mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. there's there's perhaps something that's that's related and connected to that that is beyond our understanding of it because we live in a world where yes we have advanced crazily i mean just the last 10 years alone our progression as far as technology is concerned is wild you know and it seems to me that yes. we're almost continuously uh, uh, progressing towards integrating with AI and computers and machinery. Yeah, I mean, and, and believe me, we, we're going to fuck it up again. We're going to fuck it up soon. Sure. I think maybe maybe I see it, maybe I don't in this <laughs> form, but we're going to fuck it up soon. The AI, what you see in the movies, what we were seeing in the movies of science fiction, that robots or machines were ruling the world. It will, I think it will happen at some point. We will become like Matrix in a way. We will be sleeping, yeah. living in a dream state, uh, and everyone will, will be will be run by. And I mean, it, it will come sooner than I expected. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Okay, but if we go this fast, oh man. You know, I, I I couldn't agree with you more, and uh, and obviously I do so hesitantly, but deep down I know that of course this is this is where we're headed because to me it seems like we're just on the edge of the cliff. I mean, everything that's just come out with ChatGPT and things like that. I know that yeah, these are yeah, all yeah. these are all very modern things, and we might like the average black metal fan might look at that and think like, oh well, that doesn't affect me. But however, the truth is that very slowly we have been moving towards this direction to the point now that our data like each person's data is available everywhere online now all mm -hmm. you need is one god consciousness of a computer or an ai to observe that information and then when given any form of power then basically you're just ruled by that thing but the interesting part is that we have all been, well, most of us, 99.99999% of humanity has willingly been participating in this, um, in this sort of um, dystopian yes. progression of our world mm -hmm. uh, without true, realizing true. it, perhaps. To tell you the truth, um, I think that mankind, I'm not... Um, I wouldn't say I'm exactly a misanthrope because hate is very strong emotion and it's not to be wasted and felt easily. But I think that mankind is a very dysfunctional and uh, completely um, uh, failed species. Mm -hmm. There are times that I think, okay, let's fuck this 80% of the people and the rest 20% try to rebuild things from the start. But, okay, I may be in the 80% that will go away. <laughs> Me and my family, <laughs> for example. It's a, it's a risk I can accept. But the problem is that I don't think that the 20% will not fuck, fuck it again up in, a, in some hundred years. Because I think... In the the problem is internal, is in the DNA. Our problem is in the DNA. Uh, so we are condemned to fuck things up in circles. Yeah, that's my uh, pessimistic you know, view. <laughs> I, 
I, I well, I relate to that, man. You know, but my personal thing is, I see that the, exactly what you just described there. I see that, but I try and be hopeful that you know. I try to think as the twenty percent, even like you said, if might not be a part of that. To me, you, you know, because because you know, you, you, it's it's easy to be pessimistic. You you can be a realist if you want to How be a realist. How old are you? Uh, I I hate to say it that I <laughs> I am uh, I'm 28 years old. Okay, okay. I was like you, and even more optimistic in my 28. Now I'm 53. I'm not optimistic anymore. <laughs> sure. <Sorry>. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, but but that's what I'm saying is you can be a realist. Which yes. is absolutely yeah. It looks like we're gonna really fuck things up, uh, you know. And everything from the from the the progression of technology to the military industrial complex to big pharma to big tech, it seems like everything is going in the wrong direction almost. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, if you are not optimistic, then we don't do anything about it, you know. And I think that that is yes. important to maintain and I keep agree in and, mind and, and i think also that the uh, new generation should be optimistic it's something that you must have if you want to survive otherwise as you said you give up hope and that's it <laughs> and you kill yourself if you know what if you say what i mean if, if you don't have hope and have an expectancy of something different or something better especially when you're young, then you are fucked up. Absolutely. So, you know, when you say uh, that, that humanity is going to fuck everything up because the problem is within, what do you think that problem is that's within us? And what do you think would be the solution? What exactly is it about our wiring as creatures of this planet that causes this? I think we are self-destruction. Self and we have self-destruction inherited. Mm. Um... We, um, for example, we don't have our intelligence as to other species, animals, for example. Uh, a lot of times made us better, but a lot of times have, have made us really, really bad because we, we do not have as the ancient Greek said, um, a limit. Mm. We can fuck everything up to ashes without even realizing. And what it's killing, it makes mankind that fucking up is this, because it's this self-destructing ego of every each one of us that sometimes they cannot even their ego doesn't let them cooperate in everyday stuff hmm. it's that uh, no i will do this better than you i must have uh, more money than you and more money than you because i'm better than you all these better than you think are fucked us up and uh, that's why I also don't believe in politics. Sure. There's not a political idea that I, a political theory, political movement that I can align with. There are bits and pieces to lots of them, but only bits and pieces. And that's, and I think that any political idea will fail because it's actually applied to humans for humans. So it will fail in the end. Everyone wants to be boss. Mm. Everyone thinks that he is entitled or she, or I don't know what, entitled to be boss. And I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that one very core element of what it is that you're saying there that comes down to is simply the fact that we are out of touch with nature 
and with what mother nature has to provide us with and if that was if we had a more balanced relationship with that then perhaps this could all be a lot better because we have this inherent need for survival within ourselves but we also mm -hmm. live in a world where all of those needs are already met most people already have a roof on over their heads most people already have food most people well maybe not everyone but at least most people have friends okay. you know but so it's like mm -hmm. we've got all of these things and even if they're on a very basic and minimum level we still have them and really that's all we need to survive but with with our minds the way that we are wired um we can't seem to be able to recognize that that's enough and we have to keep pushing further and i'll be the first to put my hand up and say that's exactly what i'm like i recognize that within myself and i'm sure it's probably the I, same I, for yourself I, I agree as well. with you i agree with you and that um Although sometimes the things that we want further and more lead us to do things, to make things happen. Sure. But there is not, there is not, let's say, an ethical side to it, to understand what we do and why we do it. As, as you said, yes, we are totally unbalanced. People are totally unbalanced. And uh, they have lost the touch with nature, everything. And uh, um, as I said, this ego thing sometimes made us do things. But for what reason? I mean, mm. there's a guy that makes a scientific fucking great discovery, okay, that helps everyone. Did he do it because he wanted to help everyone? Or he, did he do it because he wanted to say, ah, Guys, look what I found. I'm the best uh, doctor there is. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear that. Well, I think one... And, and big... that's the problem that I think that uh, I don't believe in any, any except mother to child, sometimes father, but rarely, uh, altruistic motive there's always mm. ego behind it even if you're a martyr for your religion you it is not altruistic you do it for you that's interesting i feel that yeah because then you know that your name will go down in history and that's uh, or you, that's or somehow you you're that, submitting your yeah. le legacy yeah you believe that you will go to heaven or to um, for, let's say for the Muslim religion, you so say you will go to the, you will eat uh, good food and have uh, lots of company. You have a motive. Yeah. To be so many virgins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know that the 70 virgins thing, it, I don't find it that motivating at all. You know, I'd, I'd probably rather go to hell and spend time with some cool people, at least uh, if that was the case. Yeah, be, <laughs> talk with 70, find 70 virgins now and hang around with them. It'd be utterly boring. <laughs> even if, even yeah. in sex, even in sex, you have to explain everything from the start. Yeah, there's no technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely, man. Well, you know, this is um, this is all very interesting to me, and I think that obviously we have to remain hopeful. But I think that a lot of this starts, as you said, it starts from within. And um, you know, I I mm -hmm. was actually. Uh, doing some meditations last night you know and and one of the the ultimate conclusions which is like it's an obvious thing but it sometimes comes back to your mind and it's that you know you you have the power to do whatever it is you want to do in the world but you always have to start from within yourself and that's the most important thing yeah I, I, for me it's the most important thing yourself your family <clears throat> Your people, your circle, and then and this way this will become naturally naturally bigger. Not by saying to someone, do this, do that. Exactly. Yes. And I think that's the problem with the world, you know, that we are constantly 
trying to change this or change that, you know, especially when it comes to political ideologies, it's always an external factor. You know, we're always trying to tell other people how to do things. Oh, this is the right idea. We should go this way. But rarely ever are we turning around, looking in the mirror, saying, well, who am I? Am I do am I taking responsibility for my own things? Am I well, yeah, in myself exactly. perfect before I tell someone else what to do? And I feel like we don't do that enough. In fact, I think po politics and religion are um, almost uh, their, their social uh, application and uh, effects on society are exactly the same. Because mm -hmm. he, he, the political party leader or the priest says, You are the right one. You know well. You are the chosen. The others do not know well. Do what I tell you. Do what I tell you. It's, a, it's the same concept either it's political either it's religious the same concept precisely and in modern times even science has been taken for hostage within the same realms i would say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah true yeah how do you think um just in, in general um obviously having done what you have done for all these years and having done what you've done with necromantia um, but also, um, I understand that you've still, you know, had to take on the normal day-to-day -day responsibilities and obligations, you know, uh, especially from the perspective that obviously the band never toured or played live at all, actually. Mm -hmm. So what's your kind of perspective? Because it's almost like you've coexisted with the world, but you've also had this outside perspective of trying to dig deep into stuff. And to me, when you're trying to dig deep into whether it's the occult or whether it's your music, at the end of the day, I feel that as an artist, you're simply just digging down within yourself. And that's the most important thing. So how would you say that that is something that's shaped your perspective of things? Or what is it that you've really been able to learn and take away from that um, unique position within the world? Um. First of all, we don't do like I don't like live shows in general. I don't okay. like I don't like live shows. I don't like black metal live shows. For me, black metal, especially the most atmospheric one, it's something that you have to experience yourself. You we sit at your home at the place you choose, you listen to the music, you read the lyrics, you understand. It's not rock and roll. I can enjoy for example, I can really enjoy a Metallica show, but I cannot enjoy that much a black metal show because I don't think that this kind of music is to be treated as a rock style with the same energy and the same stuff. I can go to an agnostic front show, drink some piano and enjoy a bit uh, people around, people beat me, you know what I mean, and go in the pit and enjoy it. But not for me. Black metal is not like that. We were um, we were thinking in the early days of Necromantia to do live shows, but we wanted to be that grand because lyrics, music, picture. We wanted the live shows to reflect also that atmosphere and stuff like that. But we needed lots of money to do it. Sure. So we decided no. Uh, in the process. We didn't care about it that much. I did some shows with the Rotting Christ in the early days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and okay, it was kind of cool, the energy of the people, you know, and anything like that. But still, it was not me. For me, music and what I make is much more internal. Uh, uh, much more for me. I feel the need to do it for me. To express myself to channel sometimes all my negative feelings and thoughts into music so I cannot go crazy. Uh, so it's like, a, wait a minute. So it's like, it's not as I said, Black metal for me is not a rock and roll thing. Although bands like Venom and stuff who shaped or started 
the genre did it this way and where uh, musically also were much more punkish in a way. But I tend to be closer to the Celtic Frost and Hellhammer thinking or the Merciful Fate. Um, now that I said Merciful Fate, I saw the Merciful Fate shows, the, the, the ones they do now, and I was like, fuck, that's what they I were, wanted to do. <laughs> they were fucking great, man. I saw them last year, uh, last August, and one of the best shows I have ever ever seen they were fucking but incredible. i saw i haven't I, I haven't been able to see them i just saw the video and i was like fuck this is a show that i want to go yes anyway irrelevant. well i guess it was um, the same it's... with uh Quirthen from bathory as well i mean that guy realized that if he wanted to do the bathory shows he probably needed like 10 million dollars per gig just to make it look and sound the way he wanted it to so he just never did them yeah i mean i really respect Quirthen for that uh, mm -hmm. Not only for that, he did a lot of things for what we are doing now. Sure. Uh, but I like I, I like this his his way of thinking, and um, so yes, music because I never followed it uh, professionally. I'm always an amateur. Amateur in Greek is erasitechnis. It's erasitechnis. Uh, erasitechnis in Greek means like what amateur actually means, lover of the art. Mm. So I'm always an erasitechnist, an amateur. I'm an, always a lover of the art because I feel that if I do it professionally, and believe me, I had the chance to take it professionally. Uh, of course. Touring, you know, I had the chances in the past. I felt that it would destroy what I do. Mm. Having a company telling me, come on, make a new album because you have to tour. And I don't feel making a new album now. I maybe do it next year or in a couple of years or in four years or never. Uh, I understand people that are doing it for a living. I admire them, but this is not something I would do with my music. That's completely respectable, so, yes. man, because... It's just you taking the artistic approach of doing what's right to you. You know, no one's asked you to do this. This is just your pure expression. So why compromise on any aspect? Exactly. Of it? Because if it's not something that you use to put bread on the table, to put it bluntly, then do it exactly as you want and exactly when you want and exactly when you feel. Exactly. Yes. That's uh, that's precisely the point that uh, I was uh, alluding to uh, earlier. I think it's a very unique perspective um, of uh, what it is that, that you had going on with Necromantia, you know. Uh, I mean, a very, very underground thing. You did it because you wanted to do it and you stuck your guns all the way to the very end. Uh, and of course, uh, I do have to uh, mention the very untimely passing of Baron Blood uh, a few years ago. And uh, I mean... What sort of mindset were you in at that time? Because I think he passed away just towards the end of 2019. And then beginning of 2020, the whole world pretty much went to Yeah, it was, uh, I think, November 2019. November or something. Okay. Yes. So that was pretty much what? You know, right at the start of everything. And then four or five months yeah. after that, the whole world is in lockdown. And we're in this very strange yeah. situation. And in that lockdown. I mean, what what was going through your mind at that time? I know you've alluded to the fact that you had a burst of creativity come over you at that time, but um, how, what were your thoughts at that time? How, how were you feeling in, in general? Because on one hand, basically, the thing that you've dedicated uh, pretty much most of your life to with Necromantia, you now know that at some point that now has to be put, laid to rest because it was a result of your... It was a byproduct of your friendship with him. But Yes, also, I mean, uh, people ask me yeah. why don't you not... Why you don't continue the band since you have still music to write? I said, because Necromantia, is, it was me and him. We were mm. two. These two people from the beginning. Yeah. So, it will be unethical for me. Uh, I wouldn't feel good to continue without... Okay, if I can, I can find a lot of 
people even to play the eight string bass. But no, that chapter ended because half of the band didn't was not here with us anymore. So I decided to stop it. I mean, it, it was for me the only option to tell you the truth. The only option. I still continue to do music with a new project, with a new band, but just that's something else uh, about the corona. You know, because I'm a seclusive person, I'm not socializing that much. Mm. It was not that bad for me. Uh, for example, if I won the lottery and won 10 million euros or something, I would buy a fucking castle and go there and isolate from, from, from the society and I will only engage with the society when I want to. Buy food, buy this, when I really want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not when I'm obliged to do. <laughs> I can That's relate what, to that, sure. Uh, for people tell me what you would do if you were rich, I said, okay, fuck, fuck you all. I would say, fuck off and bye-bye. That's -bye. what I would do. Uh... And not buy, uh, I don't know, houses and uh, boats and uh, cars. No, I don't care about that. I would buy my isolation from society. That's what I would buy with my money. I uh, appreciate anyway, that. so so Corona for me it was not that bad. I was, uh, I did a lot of things. I did the Necromantia album. I did some translations of books that I work with. Um, so it was a very productive period. Not good money-wise, because jobs were closed. But um, psychologically-wise, I felt good. When I was out in the street to go and buy something, and it was like a zombie apocalypse, no one walking in the street, I was like, wow, that's the sound of silence in the city. Mm. So yes, Corona was really, was really bad. Maybe it was a sign that I was telling you about we need to. Anyway. Uh, but for me, psychologically, it felt perfect. I didn't have any problem with it. So the, fact, my that, so the fact that it happened right after basically the the, the tragedy that befell at the end of 2019. Uh, no, because that's uh, because the corona happened. It gave me the luxury and the time to work on Ukrainian material, the, the, the yeah. farewell album. And you know what? I really, absolutely have to point this out. I mean, to anyone who has listened to the depths this end, to the depths with this end album, can probably attest to this. But it's. Um, it is a strong record, and what a fantastic and beautiful tribute did you have with And the Shadows Wept. I mean, that song... Uh, I know that Baron Blood actually, he composed parts of that song, if not the whole thing, and, and that final no. line that you say... No, no, is... no, no, no. It's, no? it's... No, I mean, no, it's... I did it all myself together with George Emanuel from uh, who played the guitars, you know, from Lucifer Child. Sure, we yes, yeah, yeah, I, I know George, yeah, yeah. great guitar player, yes. Uh, great guitar player, extremely talented musician and very good producer. With George, we had the connection, even from when we were working with Yotheria. Yeah. When we had the connection that he immediately understood what I wanted to transmit with the music. So I said, this should be like, and before I finished my sentence, it was already there. And I was like, fuck. We kind of connected in a way. So um, I really, st I still, when I listen to this song, I still get goosebumps. And sometimes, uh, you know, my eyes get a little blurry of course. at that part. Uh, for me, it was really strange to work for a Necromandia album without Baron. But then in the process, I realized that, that I do this for him, like a tribute, a final tribute for him, for a guy that I knew since I was 15 years old. 
Uh, but still, that song really, really, really tightens my heart, even when I hear it now. Yeah, I mean that outro where you say the final line, and then you hear the obviously you do this beautiful bass solo that's on top of like mm. a guitar solo. That is like I remember listening to that, and then listening to it again after listening to you talk about it in an interview and being the same, just goosebumps and being like taking deep breaths, like. Phew wow okay you know you really feel something you know and it's it's powerful having that so earlier on in the album as well you would normally think a song like that would be maybe like the last song or or something like that but it's just such a powerful piece man and uh i think yeah i mean yeah the first song was the more uh the, the song that gets your blood going sure but the second song was the the song, the reason that why this uh, album was made was that song, in a way. Sure, sure, sure. I I understand that. Yeah. Well, it's great, man. You know, I think I think you did the. You have absolutely from all of the different perspectives, because uh, there's a lot of ways when you have this. Uh, I know you didn't like the word, but legendary uh, band and music <laughs> entity within. Uh, you know, when you've got something like that at hand. Many, 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 many times bands just do it wrong or they do something at some point where they ruin it. And I can name a million examples of that. Bands that were mm -hmm. fantastic in the 90s, but then somehow they found, they found some way to kind of ruin that reputation a little bit later on, you know. And uh, obviously, I don't want to name names, but I think we can probably think of quite a few examples of that. But I feel yeah. like with yourself, with Necromantia, you managed it perfectly right and i think that uh, i mean what what i thought was interesting was also uh, the album that you did with uh, your theory as well was very powerful um uh, which i think it came out same year just around a couple of years ago and that was i think that was even the first time you ever participated in a music video right <laughs> yeah true yeah uh... It was Jim's idea. He was always insisting, let's do a video, let's do a video, let's do a video. I said, okay, let's do a video. Well, uh, I think it, it looks so cool because you've got all these guys, proper metal, and they're going for it, but you're there and you're not pretending. You're just you, you know? And I think for anyone mm -hmm. watching that who might not be familiar with, say, your history with Necromantia mm -hmm. or even Thou Art Lord, they might look at that and mm -hmm. think, oh, who is this man? He he looks so interesting. You know why is he why is he like this and why does he have such a good or, voice? But he you know, I think or, it's or a, he looks or he looks weird because if you if, <laughs> when we uploaded the video, I was I was reading the comments and I was laughing my ass out of it. <laughs> who, is okay. he, who, who is this uncle? Uh, uh, something you know something like that. And <laughs> I was like okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, even in the, the the Magus video, the first uh, visual video will come out uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Even okay. there, I'm there, but I'm not there. I'm sure. there, but I'm not there. You will not see me, but I'm there in the video. Sure, uh, I understand. So if you like Euphoria, believe me, the Magus album, it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life yet, musically. That's uh, very big words. Okay. Okay. Is, wow. I'm is. intrigued. Every uh, every song has a different character. Mm. With um, climax in the last song, which is uh, you remember the "Give the Devil His Due" in Necromantia, the yes. bass. Okay. In the Bagus album, it's "Give the Devil His Due." The story. It's the story behind. Ah. And it's a around 10 minute song. Uh, also, you know, King Dude, the artist King Dude. I, I'm familiar with him, yes, of course. Okay. And it's a black metal blues. Right, right. I am fucking. It started as a blues. That's why I, I also cooperated with King Dude because I like this distinctive bluesy Nick Cave of type voice. Sure. And it and it it climaxes to black metal holocaust in the end, but it tells the story of the give the devil his due. Because there's a guy in a bar. You will listen in the song because you hear a bar in the beginning, yeah. drinking alone, and then it's 
Mephistopheles comes to the bar to Terence and tells him, okay, man, it's time to pay your debts. The man is very excited because he made a pact with Satan and pact with the devil. And he said, okay, yeah, come on, take me to hell and make me a demon and king and shit like that. Mephistopheles has another story. <laughs> he actually tells me, you got it all wrong. We gave you things, but you fucked it up. So you're not going to get anything now. Just, your soul will, it will be just food for our dogs. That's very the, interesting. The, the essence of the song. And it's also a live choir that sings in Latin like the, um, the infernal, in a praise the dark prince because it's infernal justice and his justice is swift and his justice is... It has a whole story. This is the climax of the song. It's the last song of the album. But every song follows another path. For example, the Ama Lilith song, which has only the vocals was done only by women. They used two women singers, two metal women, one from uh, half South or North and the other from uh, uh, Web, Helpai from Web. They made all the vocals. One of them, Helpai, made the black metal vocals, and the other singer made because in the in the uh, in the middle of the song, there's this four-minute ritual called to Lilith that is kind of dead can dance means diamond at the last. Oof, okay. Right and on. it's also the more normal songs. Um, but every song has its fucking its fucking meaning, its fucking um, concept. And believe me, the, the opening, which is a very short one, it's around two minutes, it's called This Is My Church, where Lucifer speaks. Uh, it gets you so deep into the atmosphere of the album from the beginning that when I play to people, to friends from bands here, we're like, wow, what is this intro? It's like, okay, we now understand what your album is about from the intro. Mm. Anyway, you will very, very fascinating. I cannot wait to hear this, man. And I, uh, to the point of the story you were mentioning about To the Devil is Due, that also reminded me of what you were saying earlier about just the figure of Prometheus giving fire to humanity, yes, but yes. then in your accord, because, humanity fucking it up, basically. Yes, because uh, you see, the guy, when you read the lyrics, is very happy that sure. he will be like Prince of Hell or something. But if he always says no. Hmm. very interesting man listen brother i appreciate you coming on the podcast so very mm. much and uh, i've really enjoyed this conversation with you um something else to... before i go something else please yes i really liked your band man i didn't know oh. it i checked it because they told me okay this guy will do the english from there okay i really like that you are not blasting all the way all the time uh, and I really like, you have this heavy metal feeling also, mm. which I really like. And you try to find, to make something different, your own. Two bands try that now. Very few. You make, you try to make something with not good production because, you know, there are bands that say, okay, well, now we do something for our own and they have just a killer production. But the music is very average. You do it with music. You do it with, uh, that's why I always say to, we should make music more organic as it was before, not just full of effects. And you are dying, trying to do that. So, thumbs up for your band. I really like That's Honestly, not because I am in the interview. I appreciate that so very much, man. And I'm grateful that you took the time to check out uh, Trivex. Really honored to hear that from mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, poof, what, what do I say after that? <laughs> Just to kind of round thing off, I guess. Um, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, th to your point as well, that organic thing is exactly what we are all about. That's exactly what I like to do with music. Yes. And that's exactly the thing that I appreciate, the music that you have done um, with Necromancy, obviously, but with every other project that you have been a part of. I know I can trust that if I'm listening to something from the Magus, it's going to be real. 
and it's going to come straight from the heart and it's going to be something. And even when you're mentioning the lyrics and, and everything, yes. it's, 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 it's real. There's a story to tell. It's not just, exactly. oh, let's pr play something that's grim and frostbitten or whatever. No, you create your and, own and thing. Even, and and even the production that. That you, the production that you will listen, I said we were working with George again. I said, man, we have to make it a bit warmer. I don't like this. I, I want a good, very good production, but I don't like this plastic, super boosted everything. I yes. need it a bit warmer. Yes, yeah. I, I, and I think that that is the the thing that will more than likely suit your sound. Although I can't also claim to be able to predict what the album is going to sound like, which is what makes it exciting and makes me look forward to listening to it. Um, where can people come and uh, check out your upcoming work? Uh, what's the best uh, way for them to uh, check things? <clears throat> they must connect to our Facebook page and our Instagram, where there are also updates all the time, and the Magus, the Magus Facebook page and the Magus Instagram. So far, it's only available a teaser of the album with some parts. It's already on YouTube. If you go to our uh, Facebook page, you will find a link. Uh, the, the first official video will come out in June. Uh, and the album will go, the official release date of the album, it's on Halloween 2023, on October. In October, sorry. Very special. I cannot wait for that. And do we have a title for the album yet? Yeah. Uh, it's a Greek title. It's called Visodomondas. 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 Visodomondas in Greek means, actually, the literal meaning is building in the depths, but the, the meaning that we use in the everyday language means conspiring in the darkness. Mm. It's a very, it's not a very common word. Uh, yeah. because visos means depth that's where avisos come from also um, yeah. and domondas means build so visodomondas is like building in the depths well with the last necromancy album being called to the depths we descend is this exactly done on that's purpose? where we start from again yes right right very well done man i appreciate that and uh yeah, like I said, looking forward to it. So, yeah, obviously all of those links of everything, all the socials and whatnot will be available mm -hmm. in the description so people can just uh, check it out. So as we bring this to a conclusion, Magus, I would like to thank you one more time. Thank you so much for being on Eblis Manifestations. It's been a fucking blast. Thank you, man. As I told you, it was one of the most interesting interviews I've ever had because we talk a lot for a lot of for a lot more things than just music. And I really appreciate that. That makes things interesting. That's awesome to hear, man. That's why we do it here. And uh, yeah, to everyone else listening to the podcast thus far, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this one. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on the next episode. Cheers. Okay, bye guys. Mm -hmm.